multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies and pregnancy. This article is going to help us understand the risk of relapses during pregnancy and in the postpartum period and their association with the use of different disease modifying therapies. And I want to give credit to Wei Zhen Ye, the first author of this excellent publication from the MS Base Study Group. And we're going to talk about the risk of relapses and how it's affected by different disease modifying therapies. Now this is a challenging issue because a lot of young women have MS and a lot of them want to have children. And of course, a lot of disease modifying therapies aren't really safe during pregnancy, in particular the oral agents, especially medications such as Abagio, but even the S1P receptor modulators such as Gelenia, Mazent, and Zaposia, and also Duroximal Fumarate Vumerity and Tecfidera are both considered to be contraindicated during pregnancy because of the potential risk of birth defects. Now, you should definitely talk to your own provider because this is a dicey issue and different providers may have different opinions and you want them to consider your specific situation. But basically, this study is not a randomized trial. They just looked at pregnancies in the real world. So they looked at a total of 1,998 pregnancies from 1,619 1619 women with MS. So some women got pregnant multiple times and they looked at what happened in the real world. Now, the data I'm going to show you has both raw data and corrected data. And the idea here is that the disease-modifying therapy women choose isn't random. For instance, women with more severe MS may choose more aggressive therapies such as Limtrada, and so the results can be a little bit biased, and they attempt to correct for that and other factors such as age and pre-pregnancy activity of the disease and things like that. And they use certain statistical techniques, but you have to take it with a grain of salt. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about the methodology, but just to comment on it a little bit, they use a lot of different statistical tests for instance, the Wilcoxon match Paris sign rank test is supposed to correct for non-normally distributed variables, and they kind of choose the statistical test based on the situation. So you really have to trust the statistician here, and it can be a little bit biased. There's potential for fudging the numbers. So really, we're only going to consider something significant if all the data points in the same direction, like the raw data and the corrected data. Another thing to note is that you know they're correcting for hazards, so they're using Cox models for proportional hazards, and you can't really correct for every variable. There can be subtle and subjective reasons that people choose different medications that are really hard to correct for. And also, when you start getting smaller and smaller pieces of the data, for instance, women taking Lemtrada under age 25, you know, you can get a lot of statistical error because there just aren't that many people in this category. So let's review what happens normally during pregnancy in multiple sclerosis. So we're looking at three different time periods prior to conception, during pregnancy, the first, second, and third trimester, and then after delivery, and three different time periods, pre-2005 in the green, in the orange 2005 to 2010, and in the blue 2011 and onwards. And we're looking at the annualized relapse rate, the average number of relapses per person per year. And you can see there's certain baseline rates of average relapses, and it actually goes down dramatically during pregnancy, especially during the third trimester. And the reason we think this happens is because there's a natural adaptation to not attack the fetus, because the fetus is somewhat of a foreign body that's antigenically different from the mother. And there are naturally higher endogenous steroids in the body during pregnancy and other physiologic adaptations and high estrogen levels and low levels of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, for example and other things that are difficult to describe. However, after delivery, there's a temporary increase in relapse as a sort of rebound effect. Not so well demonstrated in this particular study, but it's well recognized, and it's mostly during the first three to six months in the postpartum period, and then the average rate of relapses goes back down to normal. You can also see there's a difference based on time periods because MS is becoming a little bit milder overall. So the highest rate of relapses is in the pre-2005 epoch and it's decreasing and decreasing. And this may be due to the use of disease modifying therapies or because we're getting better at diagnosing milder multiple sclerosis, MRI machines are getting better, that kind of thing. But the overall pattern is still the same, that there's a decrease in relapses during pregnancy, but a rebound afterwards. And now we'll move to looking at the individual disease modifying therapies. 
therapies. And these graphs look complicated, but we're looking at the exact same thing. We're looking at the time prior to conception, the three trimesters of pregnancy, and the postpartum period. And all of these charts, the y-axis is the annualized relapses. Again, the average number of relapses per person per year. Now, the left graph shows all the disease-modifying therapies. So green is natalizumab or Tysavri, orange is fingolimod or Gelenia, blue is dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera, purple is low-efficacy disease-modifying therapies such as glutiramer acetate formulations such as copaxone and interferon formulations, and green is no disease-modifying therapy. Now, it looks like people taking disease-modifying therapies actually do worse, particularly Tysabri and Gelenia. Now, take this with a grain of salt. Of course, people who aren't on therapy are usually people who are more stable, have milder MS, but the reason this is going on is partly due to the mechanism of action of some of these medications. So the problem with medications such as Gelenia and Tysabri is they don't deplete immune cells. They only sequester lymphocytes. So natalizumab or Tysabri works by blocking entry of lymphocytes into the central nervous system. And Gelenia traps lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. And so when you stop taking it, there's this rebound effect because those lymphocytes are still there that are potentially autoreactive and they can come in and infiltrate the nervous system, sometimes causing severe relapses, particularly with Tysabri, but also with Gelenia. So if you look at the orange line, you're looking at Gelenia. People get pregnant, they have to stop their medication. You can see disease activity goes way up during pregnancy, which is a disaster. And for all of these medications, you can see this huge spike in the postpartum period. People get postpartum relapses because you're protected a little bit during the pregnancy. So you can see the orange and the green lines referring to Gelenia and Tysabri respectively. Interestingly, there's also a big spike with Tecfidera because, again, you're sort of unprotected during that postpartum period. And so this kind of makes sense. And that's why Tysabri and Gelenia, in my personal opinion, aren't really great medications for people who are planning to become pregnant or could become pregnant. I think the B-cell depleters are generally better options. That's just my personal opinion. Now let's look at this next graph B, looking at Tysabri. And they show an interesting strategy here. Tysabri may be safe during pregnancy. Now this is a little bit controversial, but preliminary data suggests that it's relatively safe and some providers are comfortable with this. Again, talk to your own doctor. And so they talk about a washout period, meaning just stopping Tysabri prior to pregnancy, letting it exit the body prior to becoming pregnancy, taking Tysabri up to the first trimester. The idea is that during the first trimester, there isn't a lot of transfer across the placenta, so not a lot of the drug gets into the fetus because it's a larger molecule. And then the blue, which is taking Tysabri beyond the first trimester. And they talk about taking it up to 32 to 34 weeks of pregnancy. And you can see that continuing Tysabri during pregnancy is a viable strategy. You can see people who stopped it earlier in the green and orange lines definitely have more postpartum relapses. People continuing it beyond the first trimester, and again in the article they explain usually up to 32 to 34 weeks, seems to be protective, although people definitely still have postpartum relapses. Interestingly, with dimethylfumarate, it didn't really make a difference whether you allowed a washout or not, but I am surprised to see this phenomenon where people taking Tecfidera, dimethylfumarate, they definitely have a lot of postpartum relapses. I suppose it makes sense because they weren't protected during the pregnancy. What about Gelenia? They talk about washout versus no washout. Now, in this situation, it's a little bit different because no one would really recommend continuing taking Gelenia during pregnancy. But the question is here, let's say you stop it a little bit before. Usually, it's recommended to stop Gelenia approximately two months prior to attempting conception because it does have a longer half-life versus uh, just no washout, which meaning essentially getting pregnant on accident while taking it. And it turns out that if you stopped it before, in other words, allow a washout, People seem to do a little bit better. They have fewer relapses during pregnancy and fewer postpartum relapses. You can see the green line relative to the orange line. Of course, you don't want to get pregnant taking Gelenia anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And now we'll break it down a little bit, looking at the risk factors of relapse during pregnancy. So not postpartum relapse during pregnancy. So the first is age. And the good news is that even though being older increases the risk of other pregnancy-related complications, it actually decreases the risk of relapse 
value app. So for the purposes of this, we're going to look at the unadjusted odds ratio. So if you're over 35, you have about a 60% reduced risk of relapse during pregnancy. People who are less disabled, who have a lower EDSS score, EDSS is Expanded Disability Status Scale, a measure of disability used in MS research. I have a separate video on it if you click the card above. It turns out if you have a lower disability, EDSS less than two, which is very low, you have a slightly lower risk, but really only a 28% lower risk, not a big difference. And if you had more relapses prior to conception, you have a greater risk of relapses during pregnancy. Now, if you look at the medications, like I said before, some of the stronger disease-modifying therapies, Tysabri and Gelenia, actually increase the risk of having a relapse during pregnancy. And of course, it's due to this rebound effect. You stop the medication, the lymphocytes rush in, and that's by a factor of 2.5 or 3, respectively. Not trivial. And then they look at washout, and it turns out continuing Tysabri into pregnancy doesn't really reduce the risk significantly. Same with Fingolimod or Gelenia. Interestingly, dimethylfumarate may reduce the risk by about 60%, but it's unsafe to take this during pregnancy, in my opinion. And now we'll move to what's probably even more important, which is the prevention of postpartum relapses, because they're quite frequent. And again, unadjusted hazard ratio to the left, and adjusting for multivariate analysis to the right. So again, we see younger people, or excuse me, older people older than age 35 are a little bit less likely to have relapses by about 40%. And this is probably because older people have a lower risk of MS relapses in general. Again, people with more disability, greater or equal to two on the EDSS scale, have about double the risk of relapses in the postpartum period. People who had more relapses prior to getting pregnant have about a 50% increased risk. But what's interesting here is in reinitiation of disease-modifying therapy in the postpartum period. So we're trying to prevent relapses by restarting disease-modifying therapy, possibly in lieu of breastfeeding. Now, all of a sudden, Tysabri looks to be highly effective. So we see a 70% decrease in relapses, hazard ratio of 0.32. And if we adjust for other factors, the severity of the disease, things like that, it's 90% effective. Now, for Lemtrada, you can see the hazard ratios are going in opposite directions. You're five times more likely to have relapses, but if you adjust for other factors, all of a sudden, 70% less likely to have relapses. Obviously, we can throw this away. Now, interestingly, for anti-CD20 agents, rituximab, Ocrevus, Arzera, Casimpta, we can see that people are having a lot of relapses, about a four-fold increased risk. This is very different from my experience. Generally speaking, people taking these agents, particularly if they got them prior to pregnancy, they don't really have a lot of postpartum relapses. That's just my anecdotal experience. I think what's going on here is that a lot of these patients were taking another drug before, like Gelenia or Tysabri, and a lot of these relapses are really a rebound effect from those other drugs, not because of the inefficacy of the new drug. It just takes a little bit of time to work. With Jelenia, we see the hazard ratios going in the opposite direction. We can throw that out. With Tecfidera, there's really no effect in preventing postpartum relapses. Interestingly, people taking low-efficacy medications like glutiram or acetate and interferon do pretty well with about a 60% reduced risk of postpartum relapses, but this may be because their MS isn't that bad overall. Interesting is breastfeeding. Now, my former mentor, Dr. Annette Langergold, previously had a very famous publication where she showed that exclusive breastfeeding prevents postpartum relapses and is actually quite effective. And there's a unique physiology to exclusive breastfeeding where there are high levels of prolactin but suppression of ovulation. And interestingly, introducing even a small amount of formula can disturb this endocrine physiology and make it less effective. But in this study where they didn't discriminate between exclusive and non-exclusive breastfeeding, they did found adjusting for different factors there was about a 40% reduced risk of relapses. So this data suggests that maybe it's not a good idea to avoid breastfeeding just to restart medication since there are other benefits of breastfeeding. The exception might be someone who has aggressive MS. Maybe the benefits of treatment would outweigh the benefits of breastfeeding. And here it looks like Tysabri may actually be the best or most effective medication Again, it may be most appropriate for someone who is higher risk. So I hope that was helpful, and let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or suggestions for future videos.